before they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall, somebody say shall, shall reward thee openly. You may be seated. Last week when we began this lesson on fasting, we spoke about the importance of fasting. And if you remember last week, we talked about the purpose of fasting. What is the purpose of our fast? And we said the purpose of our fast was for four very important reasons. First of all, it was that we personally examine ourselves. Next, we said that it allowed for personal humiliation. Third, we said it allowed for personal mortification. Some things have to die in our lives. Amen. And we said that it was necessary for our personal rededication onto God. Today, for a few minutes, we're just going to talk about the practice of fasting. Why is it important? Not just the purpose of, fast, of fasting, but the practice of it. But the practice of it. We just read the scripture, didn't we? We just read that lovely scripture that Jesus told us how we are to fast. And we discussed it before, but I want you to hear this again. That fasting defines the outworking of the life of righteousness. It defines the outworking of the life of righteousness. Now, fasting is a work. It is a work. But it's not a work that can save you. Works cannot save us. Amen? We can only be saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ once we have, once we have repented of our sins and accepted Christ as our Savior. That is the message of salvation. Amen? You cannot work your way into heaven. You cannot work your way to God. That is what differentiates Christianity from every single other religion in the world. Every single one, bar none. And what is that? It's that in every other religion, you must work. You must work your righteousness. You must prove you're holy. You must do so many things to prove that you are uh, reaching certain states uh, of spiritual enlightenment and so forth. No, but in Christianity, amen, we who are Christ followers, we understand this, that it is not about our work. It is about Jesus's finished work, amen? But when we work, we work because we are doing so in order that God will see our good works and reward us openly. He will see our works and then will empower us to live for him in such a way that shows his goodness and his mercy. He will empower us to do that which we're unable to do. The fasting, amen, isn't going to get you to heaven. The fasting isn't going to uh, uh, make you, amen, more holy necessarily. But what it does do is it gives God an opportunity to get our attention. It's a sign, amen, of God's work in our lives. But that sign is not grace. It is a means of grace. But it is not the grace of God. It is not the power of God. It is not the strength of God. It's a means to those things. Do you, do, does that make sense? If you've ever been coming back from Jacksonville or coming up North 95 from Savannah, and you see a sign, and the sign says Brunswick. So many miles. Well, that sign is not Brunswick. That sign points to a larger reality. 
which is Brunswick. You don't see that sign and say, oh, I'm in Brunswick. Look, I'm, I got this sign, right? No, this sign is Brunswick. No, this sign points. Somebody say points. It points to Brunswick, right? These things that we do, amen, it points us in a direction where we can receive from God. Where we can be filled with his Holy Spirit. Where we can be strengthened by his power. Amen. It is the outworking of righteousness. We said that although we are able to truly be dedicated to God without fasting. We find that when we fast. Our time with God is deeper. It's richer. It's more powerful. This process of discipline, discipline, excuse me, self-denial must be properly practiced, however. And today we're going to talk about one area of the practice. I don't have time to go into all of it today. But it must be practiced sensibly. Somebody say sensibly. And it must be practiced secretly. Somebody say secretly. So let's deal with the sensibly part first. It says in verse 16 and 17, Jesus said, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face. Amen. Verse 17 says that we are to, I should say, you know, I, I'm sorry, I started at the wrong place. I wanted to go in verse 16 and 17. He says, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be a, of a sad countenance. Don't disfigure your face. Don't try to look like you're doing something for God. Amen. Because if you do, that will be your reward. If you're going around, oh, look at what I'm doing for you, God. Well, then that's your reward. Amen. Amen. So, so, the, so it tells us, Jesus tells us very clearly that when you do this, wash yourself, anoint yourself, Business as usual. Amen. Don't look. Oh, man, I can't hardly wait till we're finished with this. Oh, I can't hardly wait. I'm tired of eating beans and rice. Open brown rice. Thank you, my brother. Can't eat just any kind of rice. But open your heart to the fact that there are those today that are dying because they don't have a meal. Children, amen. Amen. Who have become, whose bodies have become so distended and disfigured because they literally don't have clean water or a meal to eat. And we complain because we can't eat what we want. God is trying to get our attention. Be sensible. And so what kind of sense are we to bring to this? Well, huh. The Jews were required to fast once a year on the Day of Atonement. We said that. That was in Leviticus 16. However, what the Jews would do is the Jews would impose upon themselves two additional days every week on Mondays and Thursdays where they would fast. And by doing this, they would try to prove that they were more holy than other people. Because I'm doing more than I'm required to do. By doing this, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. I'll say it again. They trusted in themselves for their own righteousness. They believed, amen, that what they did made them righteous. See, there's some of us that are still confused about some of this stuff. We believe if I do good stuff, I'm a good person. Amen. If I work real hard for God, he, he's going to be happy with me. Well, I'm here to tell you today that no amount of good works can make you good. Amen. We're sinners from the start. Amen. And without Jesus in our lives and the salvation of Christ in our hearts, there is no hope. No matter how good you are, there are a lot of good people that are going to go right to hell that have done great things. Amen. I should say people who have called themselves good. 
But if they reject Jesus Christ. I remember once someone was talking to Oprah Winfrey. And they were asking her about Jesus. And they, she looked at them with, oh, a look, amen, that was not of this world. Some of you get that. And said, what about Jesus? What about Jesus indeed? But I'm going to tell you right now, I can't do the good works that Oprah does. I don't have those resources. I can't build hospitals. I can't build schools. I can't give people stuff. I can't give away cars. And I can't pay somebody's mortgage off. I can't build somebody's house. I can't pay, I can't to pay them out of debt. I don't have that. And all those are very good works. But do those good works qualify her for salvation? No. The only thing that qualifies her for salvation is if she stopped saying, what about Jesus? And said, come now, Lord Jesus. I accept you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Save my wretched soul. Amen. Good works won't get you into heaven. No matter how good we may think we are, that Bible says there is none good, not one. So if you think you're good today, I'm here to burst your bubble. You're not good. There is none good. No matter how good you think you are. No matter how many good things you've done. When it comes to God's eyes. In God's sight. No, we're lost and we're hopeless. We're like sheep without a shepherd. In need of salvation. So they would do these things. They would perform these acts. They would uh, uh, go through all these things uh, trying to look as though they were better than the others. You remember the publican and the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18? If you'll just go there for just a minute. In Luke, the 18th chapter. And in the 18th chapter of St. Luke, and in verse 9, you see, this is why the gospel of Jesus Christ and the profession of the faith, of faith in Jesus Christ, and our walk as a Christian is the most unpopular thing you'll ever do. Christianity is not designed to be popular. Amen. It's not designed to have a popularity on par with the things of the world. This message of salvation through grace, through repentance of sin, and the preaching of sin. Oh, help me, Jesus. Is not popular. Because who wants to be told they're not good? Who wants to be told that they're sinners in need of salvation? Who wants to be told, amen, that you can't live any way you want, even if you show up at church every single day? I mean, if you're the first one in the door and the last one to leave, if you're not living according to Scripture. Amen. It's time out for the church smoozing over or changing what God said. And making people feel comfortable because we're trying to please people. We want people, amen, to see us as popular when no, the gospel is never popular. Oh, no, it's not. You and I ran from the gospel. You and I didn't want the gospel spoken unto us. You and I didn't want to hear the truth. Amen. But thank God that God allowed somebody to never give up on us and preach the word of God until we came to him on our knees asking for God's forgiveness. Tells us in verse 9 of chapter 18 of Luke that Jesus spake unto certain, and here it is, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. In other words, the things I do make me righteous. 
They saw themselves as righteous because they performed righteous acts. How many of us are fooled by that today? Because you perform righteous acts, you think you're righteous? No, no, we're righteous because it's the gift of God. Amen. It's the free gift of God. Somebody say the free gift. It's the free gift of God. It's not something you achieved. It's not something you work for. It's not something you earn. Oh, amen. It's something that was given freely because of Jesus' finished work. Finished work. And he said, look at, look at this. He says, they thought themselves to be righteous, and they did what? They despised other people. Amen. So here's somebody in the church praying, right, who thought he was righteous and hated other people. Let's go on. Two men went up into the temple to pray, Jesus said. One was a Pharisee, the other was a publican. The Pharisee stood, and look at this, prayed thus with whom? Himself. Somebody say himself. See, he prayed with himself. He thought he was speaking to God, but he wasn't. He was simply talking to himself. His prayer wasn't, his prayer, somebody say, wasn't even hitting the ceiling. No, it wasn't leaving him. Right? He prayed thus with himself. Right? And here's what he said. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. They're extortioners and they're unjust and they're adulterers or even, and he points now, points now to the little publican over on the other side of him, or even as that guy over there, as even as that publican over there. And here he goes, I fast twice in the week. There it is. Did his fasting, although it was a righteous act, did it make him righteous before God? No. His sense of what God does and his sense of who God is was warped. No, he thought because I did good things, I therefore should receive the goodness of God. No, that's not what Jesus said. He said, listen, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Oh, yes. I tithe. I fast. Some of you think that. Man, I'm a tither here in this church. Man, I'm doing this fast just according to all. I'm doing everything. I know I'm blessed. See, the thing about it is, if the President of the United States walked in here this morning, he wouldn't have to say, I am the President of the United States. He wouldn't have to. Because he is. He is. Amen. Now, maybe this President might, but a President wouldn't have to. That's who you are. Amen. I am the President. Yeah, you yeah, we know. That's who you are. When you understand that a child of God is blessed, highly favored, prosperous, amen, redeemed, made free by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, covered, amen, uh, by the blood. I mean, uh, delivered from sin, strengthened. You don't have to walk around. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm blessed and highly favored. You don't have to do it. Now, you can say it if you want to. But I want to I want to ask I want to challenge you today. Amen. Do you really say it? Amen. Because you truly amen are saying it for the benefit of someone else. Doesn't do anything for you. What's it going to do for you? That's who you are. But are people coming to Jesus because you go around bragging that you are blessed and highly favored? I'm blessed and highly favored. Blessed and highly favored. Good for you. Amen. Amen. If that's who you are, then act. Practice. Somebody say practice. Amen. Act. Somebody say act. Amen. Do. Somebody say do. do. Be. Somebody say be. be. That's what you're supposed to do. Be a Christian. Act like a believer. Practice the things of Christ. 
Oh, help me, Jesus. Amen. Excuse me. But we like to show off these type of things. I tithe. I fast. And Jesus said, and how's that working for you? Not that these things are wrong and we must do these things. But what I want us to focus on today, we just have a minute or two left. What we have to focus on today is this. Don't think that your doing of the thing makes you righteous. Don't think that the doing of the thing makes you uh, more special to God. Don't think that the doing of the thing makes you more holy. Don't think that the doing of the thing, amen, makes you some little uh, 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 special little Christian, amen, and everybody else needs to catch up to your righteousness. When somebody's going through something difficult and you know they haven't been living right or you know there's some difficulty, when you hear it, maybe you don't say it out loud, but do you say it in your heart? Well, you know what? You should have listened to me. Uh-huh. How you expect them? I mean, you know what they're doing. Might be very true. But does that help them? No, it doesn't. No, we've got to show them the love of Jesus Christ and draw them to Christ by his, draw them to the love of Christ, amen, by our righteous actions, amen. Look at what Jesus said in verse 13. And the publican, somebody say the publican. The publican standing afar off. Afar off connotes not only away from everyone else, but feeling in his spirit that I shouldn't even be here. I'm not even worthy to stand here in front of you, Lord. He would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What are we saying? That if you truly want God in your life, and you truly desire the work of God in your life, then there is a humility that comes with who you are because you know who you are and you know that you're powerless to change who you are. I'll say that again. You know who you are and you know that you're powerless to change who you are. So any change that anyone sees is not up to your good work or up to something you did really good. It's up to the grace of God that, was, that came into your life and changed you by his power not yours. So when someone asks you of the hope that dwelleth in you, you don't start rattling off, you know, some little diatribe of your greatness and your work. You just say, praise God. God has been good. I thank the Lord. His grace has been sufficient. Find a way to let others know that who you are, amen, was not due to your work. It was due to the work of the Lord in your life. Amen. Jesus went on to say this. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. You see that? He went home justified in the eyes of God rather than the other, right? For everyone that exalted him or herself, right, shall be what? Abased, shall be brought down. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen? He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Because we understand that that is God's work. Scripture gives the Christ follower no specific time when they are to fast. No specific 
uh, amount of time that they're supposed to fast. You see, fasting is still necessary and it's applicable to us today. Some people practice fasting on Fridays immediately before Easter, you know, the Lenten season. That's when they fast. That's good for them. But the New Testament doesn't give us any basis for these type of fasts at all. At all. The fast that we are on right now, if you look around, everybody's on a fast. Oh, yeah. Everybody's, got, everybody's on a fast, right? This ministry, that ministry, everybody's on a fast, right? So what, which, which, which fast is God honoring? God is not honoring the fast that doesn't honor him. Amen. Many times we see something and we jump into something because we think it's a popular thing. Right? And it could start out that way. But the point is, let it become something that humbles you before God. Because God requires it. That's why I wanted us to hear this during the fast. Amen. That the Lord is more interested in how we practice fasting than in how much we practice it. What scripture makes clear is that fasting should be practiced with quiet discipline and we are not to draw attention to the fact that we're fasting. We are simply to do this because the scripture tells us as we read this morning, huh, that if that's the case, then you've received your reward. However, it tells us in verse, verse 18 that our Father which seeth in secret, he will reward us how? Openly. We talked about the sensible side of our fasting this week. Lord willing, next week we'll talk about why our fast must be secret. Why we must spend time with God on our own and keep some of the things that God tells us to ourselves. Amen. That is how we grow as believers in Christ. Amen. Bow your heads with me today. Father God, I give you praise and honor right now, give you glory, thank you for your goodness, your mercy is sufficient, your grace is enough, so we ask right now in Jesus' name that you continue to encourage, strengthen, bless our hearts, and show your salvation to our lives as we continue to allow your Holy Spirit to have his way in our hearts. Let the word we've received this morning encourage our hearts, strengthen our lives, bless us, and keep us, and show us your salvation.